Greetings. This is to be a lecture on Aristotle's ethics. Um, earlier in this course, we looked at Aristotle's metaphys metaphysics and epistemology, and you're going to see there's an awful lot of overlap between um, Aristotle's metaphysics and epistemology and his ethics. And, and he was a systematic thinker. I think I've mentioned systematic thinkers to you in the past, uh, where what they have to say about one topic in philosophy blends into, weaves into, develops uh, what they had to say about other topics in philosophy. And this is certainly true of Aristotle, true of Aristotle, true of Plato, true of Aquinas, true of Kant, etc. So his metaphysics and epistemology has a great deal to do with what he has to say about uh, ethics, which of course has a great deal of what he has to say about uh, political philosophy, um, educational philosophy, uh, uh, aesthetics, etc. But we're just going to be talking about primarily, we'll be talking about his ethics um, at this time. All right, so let me share my screen. And here we are. So Aristotle's ethics, two approaches. And I call it two approaches because I've sort of broken this lecture into two halves. In one half, I talk about the functional account of good and understanding what Aristotle means by a good human being by understanding how he employs this functional account of good. But in the second half, I talk about what he takes to be the final end, the summa bonum. Well, that's Latin, he spoke uh, Greek. Um, Aquinas would have called it the summa bonum, but the final good, the ultimate good that, that human beings seek and how best to achieve it. And um, so it ends up both approaches take us to the same place. So they're kind of two sets of directions that lead us to the same address. All right. And we'll be talking about that as the lecture continues. So. So virtue ethics, you may recall, is a category of ethical theories which see actions as right or wrong, depending on whether or not they flow from or are conducive to a good character. Oh, I seem to be missing the words good character there, but that's what it is, right? So I'll have to correct my slide a little bit later. So key to virtue theories of ethics is the nature, is the notion of a character. And what does it mean to be a decent human being, uh, a person with integrity, a person of character? Now, central questions to any virtue ethics would be questions such as these. What is it to be a good person? What is the ideal person? How do I achieve that ideal? What is the good life for a human being? These are questions that form the moral primitives of Aristotle's ethical system. And as I said, any virtue ethic uh, is going to be looking at these kinds of questions. The only uh, virtue ethicist we're going to be looking at in this course is Aristotle, but, um, but there are others. So preview of coming attractions uh, or spoiler alert, summary of where we're going. Aristotle's ethics is a systematic, naturalistically justified version of ancient Greek ethical thinking. Ancient Greek ethics stresses the virtues or being virtuous. Again, it was a virtue ethic culture. As opposed to merely following moral rules, that's a deontological approach, or calculating the consequences of individual actions, and that would be a consequentialist ethics. That's not what they were doing here. What, uh, what forms their lens through which they frame moral issues is the question of being a decent, virtuous, admirable character. Aristotle's ethics is based on his definition of human as the rational animal and his teleological understanding of excellence. Again, the functional account of good. We'll have more to say about those in a bit. Since the ability to reason, and by that he means the ability to deliberate over courses of action and choose on the basis of those deliberations, since that ability is the one capacity or function which separates humans from other animals, being rational is our defining quality and thus our final cause or our telos. The excellent human being is the one who actually does reason well 
and choose his or her actions on the basis of reason. This is uh, seen in the functional account of good portion of these notes. Further, as creatures of habit, it is prudent, therefore it is rational, to develop those good habits, virtues, which contribute to successful living, what Aristotle terms eudaimonia, evidenced in the lives lived by successful, thriving fellow humans, virtuous human beings, through rationally enlightened practice. So how do we achieve these good habits? How do we achieve this eudaimonia? By developing good habits. And how is that done? Through rationally enlightened practice. And again, I cover these in my notes on eudaimonia, which we're, we're, we'll deal with in a moment. So here are the two approaches, the functional account of good and the idea of the virtuous human and the moral virtues and the idea of the virtuous human. So let me do a brief aside and to talk about arite, right? Now there is no English word, this is a Greek word and, it, and I might be mispronouncing it, I'm quite sure that I am. But there is no English word or phrase that captures the exact meaning of arite. The nearest equivalence might be excellence or virtue, but there's something more to arite that cannot be expressed by those words. There's something almost divine in the idea of arite. Perhaps the only true way to understand what arite is considered to be is to consider two or more examples of excellence and try to contemplate what it is that they share. What does it mean to say of an action or an artistic work or some flawless athletic movement that it is excellent? To behold what, of, what is excellent in whatever form brings us this joy. And that's what Arite is supposed to capture, that sort of joyous response we have when we witness something of extraordinary excellence. We perform an action with excellence and we say, perfect. In the moment of excellence, something transcends the mundane and touches the ideal. Think of a, a flawless ballet performance or piano performance or an incredible act of athletic excellence. And you go, oh, Right? And you're kind of captured up and swept away. That's the meaning of excellence or virtue captured by arite. For Plato, arite is mainly associated with moral excellence. It is subordinate to specific moral virtues, such as courage, temperance, justice, something that they all share, a special unnamed quality or their essence. For Aristotle, something is excellent when it manifests its unique purpose or telos. The unique defining quality of human beings for Aristotle is what makes them distinct creatures with a capacity for rational thought. Human excellence then involves the correct use of reason and principally the correct use of reason in connection with moral choice, making choices of how to behave. All right, so we're going over two approaches to Aristotle's ethics, and we're beginning with telos or the functional account of good. So Aristotle tries to explain what we mean by good in terms of function. The functional account of good basically says this. It, it's an account of good which claims that to say a thing is good is simply to say that it does what it's supposed to do, and it does it well, excellently, efficiently. X is good equals X does what X's are supposed to do and does it well. Suppose you're helping me uh, fix dinner one evening and I ask you to bring me a good knife. What sort of knife am I asking for? Hint, I'm not asking for the yay knife as our emotivist friends might say. No, here I'm asking for a sharp knife. And why is sharp relevant to being an excellent knife? Because sharp is relevant to cutting and cutting is what knives are supposed to do. So if you know what a knife is and you know what knives are supposed to do, then you can tell good knives from bad knives. The good knives are do, uh, do do 
what knives are supposed to do and they do it well. Bad knives don't do what knives are supposed to do well. And if they don't do it at all, say I have some sort of ceremonial knife that doesn't actually cut at all. It really can't cut because it's some sort of, I don't know, um, um, object of art or ceremony. In that case, Aristotle would say it is a knife in name only. Why? Because it doesn't even do the bare minimum of what it is that genuine knives do. So it's not really a knife. It's something we call a knife, but it's a knife in name only. A thing is said to be good if it does what it's supposed to do and does it well. This refocuses questions of evaluation on questions of proper function. But also note that this is verifiable, so long as we know what X's are supposed to do. So to our logical positivist friends who wanted statements to be verifiable, Aristotle is offering an account of good, which is indeed verifiable. I can tell whether that's an excellent knife or not, and I can verify that through experiment and observation, right? So bring me the knife, and if I kind of, oh, look at this, slice, 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 slice. Look how thin, oh my gosh, you could read the newspaper through this slice, it's so thin. That shows it's an excellent knife. They do that on TV when they're selling knives sometimes, right? Or if I go, oh, look at this is a terrible knife, mush, 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 mush. It doesn't cut the tomato at all, it just mushes the tomato. Well then, right? So I have empirical verification of whether that's an excellent knife or not. But in order to gain that empirical verification, I have to know what it is knives are supposed to do. Once I know what it is knives are supposed to do, then it's merely uh, a matter of empirically discovering whether this knife in question does in fact do that function, perform that function or not. But that further means that if I do not know what a thing is supposed to do, then I can't evaluate it. So according to the functional account of good and more broadly, according to Aristotle's teleological account of goodness, if I don't know the purpose of a thing, then I can't tell a good one from a bad one. If I do know the purpose of a thing, then at least I have a, uh, a research program that I can embark on. Now, the functional account of good works well and easily for things that human beings deliberately create, because we who make those objects for a particular purpose most often know what was the purpose, right? We know why we did those, uh, why we created those things. And so we can evaluate things like can openers and dishwashers and washing machines and hair dryers and cell phones even, because we who created them know what purposes we created them to achieve. This is why we have publications like Consumer Reports or uh, Car and Driver or Road and Track or Road and Driver, Car and Track, I don't know. But anyway, you get these ideas, right? And Consumer Reports is not a publication that just publishes subjective feeling after subjective feeling after subjective feeling. No, presumably what they do is they take the products under consideration. They evaluate those products relative to a standard of functions that those products are supposed to achieve. And they determine which of those products uh, uh, efficiently, ideally, uh, admirably achieve those functions and which are kind of so-so and which are terrible, right? So that's how they come up with their, their ratings. Again, it's an empirical affair. Now, um, we do run into trouble with at least one class of human created objects. Uh, can you think of which types of objects I have in mind here? These are objects that human beings have been created, creating for thousands of years. And almost every human society that we, we know of has created such objects. Nevertheless, it's not entirely clear what those objects are supposed to do. What do I have in mind? Art, right? So art objects are objects we create. These are human uh, artifacts. We, 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 we manufacture these objects of art for, for millennia, right? For thousands of years. <laughs> Going back, I think at least 38,000 years, pretty old, right? Um, but it's not entirely clear what art is supposed to do. 
we run into trouble in the case of art because it's not clear what art is supposed to do. But notice, it, this is almost a partial confirmation of Aristotle's account of good. Why? Well, because we also have a great deal of difficulty arriving at broadly accepted evaluations of art as well. Aristotle would explain our difficulty by claiming not that we are confused about what the word good means, but rather that we are confused about what the word art means. In other words, we don't know the telos, the function, the purpose of art. And until we do, we aren't going to come out, um, uh, come to broadly accepted evaluations of good art from bad art. For the functional account of good to be applied to natural objects, not just human artifacts, but natural objects, and ultimately to human beings as well, it will be necessary to know what the function of these natural objects are first. Well, Aristotle did believe that natural objects do indeed have purposes or functions and that these purposes or functions of natural objects are discoverable to human beings by observation. Now notice with Aristotle's system here, there are two operating assumptions. Number one, that organic world, the organic world, does in part at least break itself up into natural kinds. Again, what Aristotle would call formal causality, right? So there's something that all and only cats have in common by virtue of which they are cats and distinguishes them from non-cats. There's something that all and only dogs have in common by virtue of which they are dogs and distinguishes them from non-dogs. So that the world breaks itself up into natural kinds, cat, dog, uh, fruit bats, sable palms, uh, this sort of thing. And that these natural kinds further are distinguished from one another by function. So what distinguishes one set of natural kinds from another is the functions that uh, are inherent to those natural kinds. So let's revisit words we talked about when we talked about Aristotle a couple weeks ago. Telos, the Greek word for end or purpose or function, and teleology, which is the study of a system of ends or purposes, or it might simply refer to the system itself, a system of ends and purposes. So Aristotle had a teleological worldview. He thought that the natural world did have embedded in it function or purpose, and that understanding that world requires understanding the purposes and functions that it has. Further, once we understand the purpose or functions of natural kinds, we can distinguish good members of that natural kind from uh, bad. And cutting to the chase here, uh, diseased, pathological, or pathetic members of that kind. So again, a quick revisit of something we talked about when we talked about Aristotle's epistemology and metaphysics, his doctrine of the four causes. So this is his doctrine that to know what a thing is, I must know four things about it. And what are these four things? Well, I must know the material cause of the thing. What is it made of? I must know the efficient cause of a thing, what brought it about or generated it. But I also must know the formal cause of a thing. To what species or genus does it belong? What is the kind of thing that it is? And then fourth, the final cause, what is it supposed to do? But notice for Aristotle and for organic reality, the formal cause of a thing, the kind of thing that it is, is also the final cause of a thing, the end towards which it tends. So in other words, uh, a kitten is formally a cat. It's a member of the cat natural kind. But cat nature, cat uh, uh, essence, is the end towards which kittens tend. In other words, when kittens grow up, they grow up to be cats. They don't grow up to be gardenia bushes. They don't grow up to be bulls. They don't grow up to be uh, uh, dogs. They grow up to be cats, if left to their natural ends, right? So the end towards which they're directed is cat nature. The thing that determines what they are is cat nature, formal cause, final cause. But notice something else. Where did that kitten come from? Mommy and daddy cat. 
So for organic nature, cat nature is the efficient cause of the object as well. It explains where that kitten came from. Now the question becomes, what are these natural objects supposed to do? What is the final cause, let's say, of an apple tree? Well, there's two ways Aristotle could have responded, but he did not. He could have said, oh, apple trees are here to please human beings, to serve humans. So the good apple tree is the one that provides us with delicious fruit or something like that, maybe delicious and nutritious fruit. He didn't go that route. Or he could have said, good apple trees are here to please God. They're here to achieve their God-given function, to do what God intended them to do. He didn't go that route either. He didn't go the first route, apple trees are here to serve humans, and those that serve human interests are good apple trees. He didn't go that route, but why not? Because he thought it was unjustifiably anthropocentric, right? And so for one thing, um, apple trees can be great apple trees having nothing to do with human beings. There doesn't have to be a human being anywhere around for an apple tree to be a good apple tree in his view. And that's true of lots of natures, right? To be a, a, a good, um, I don't know, hammerhead shark doesn't require that you're good for human beings. Likewise, he doesn't think it's fine-grained enough to distinguish apple trees from, say, good pear trees. So if the point of a good apple tree is to provide us with delicious and nutritious fruit, and the point of a good pear tree is to provide us with good and delicious and nutritious fruit, well, then what distinguishes apple trees from pear trees? There doesn't seem to be a functional distinction between them. It's just not fine-grained enough. Now, he could have said that apple trees are here to do what God created them to do. And so good apple trees are the ones who do what God created them to do, and bad apple trees are those that fail to do what God created them to do. But he didn't go this route either because he didn't believe in a creating God. It seems he did believe in God, and he did believe in a God that sort of sustains the universe. Oh, and we talked about that earlier in this course. But he didn't believe in a creation. He thought the universe pretty much always existed this way. So he didn't think that the universe, that, that a God created objects to uh, achieve certain functions or purposes. Aristotle claims that the only thing apple trees are supposed to do is be apple trees but presumably be the best darn apple trees that they can be. And what does he mean by that? He means they would be apple trees that do all and only the apple tree things. They fulfill apple tree nature. So if I ask you, name one function that apple trees do Perhaps the first thing that comes to mind is uh, produce apples. Yes. But do apple trees, even excellent apple trees, do they produce apple tree, uh, apples all year long? No. Right. Apples are, are, are a product of the fall. Right. Um, and then uh, in the spring, they don't have apples. In the spring, they have little blossoms. And then those blossoms turn into, you know, baby fruit. And then they mature all summer long. Um, and then in the winter, um, they lose their leaves, et cetera, and they're kind of dormant all winter long. That's part of apple tree nature. So being a good apple tree is realizing this nature, this apple tree nature. Thus, for natural organisms, the nature of the species, formal cause, is the goal of the species, final cause. So the purpose of the apple tree is to be an apple tree. Again, to realize as fully as possible apple tree nature. Suppose you, a native Floridian, move up to my hometown in Pennsylvania, and you buy a house in part because of the big apple tree in the front yard, right? You've always heard of apple trees. Uh, you're not really familiar with them because you're here, a native Floridian. Uh, but you always wanted one. And look at this house has a big apple tree in the front yard. Oh, that's the house for me, you say. However, in the middle of September, you notice that all the leaves are starting to turn funny colors and falling off your tree. Oh no, you think, there's something terribly wrong with my apple tree. And you call me up in a panic and you tell me what's going on. 
calm yourself, I would reassure you. That's how apple trees are supposed to behave. It is natural for apple trees to lose their leaves in the autumn. I know this because I grew up around apple trees. I observed apple trees. I observed healthy, thriving apple trees. I've heard, observed withering, pathological, dying apple trees. And I know that it is natural for apple trees to lose their leaves in the fall. However, if all the leaves start turning funny colors and falling off your tree in the middle of May, then yeah, you have a problem. That's not how apple trees are supposed to behave. They always say, oh, well, who's Aristotle to tell apple trees how they're supposed to behave? You're missing the point. Aristotle is not telling apple trees how they're supposed to behave, quite the reverse. Apple trees are telling Aristotle how they're supposed to behave. In other words, by observing apple trees and distinguishing the healthy, thriving ones from the withering and dying ones, I develop my understanding. And Aristotle develops his understanding of what it is to be a good, healthy, thriving apple tree. Studying the characteristic behaviors of the healthy ones will reveal the nature and thus the function of the species. The normative force here, the ought force here, is provided by health versus disease. The idea here is that one ought to be healthy and one ought not to be pathological or diseased. Note, this makes Aristotle a naturalist with regard to ethics, one who claims that normative judgments can be reduced to empirically verifiable claims. Also note that he is not contrasting good and evil, he is contrasting good and bad, healthy and pathological, vigorous, thriving, and pathetic withering. So some have cited this as a flaw in Aristotle because there is no place in his system for evil to arise. There doesn't seem to be a, 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 a space for that on his ethical system because he isn't contrasting good and evil. What he is contrasting is excellence and pathetic. So now the question becomes, what is the human telos? What is the human purpose or function, the end towards which we're directed, which will determine excellent human beings from pathological or diseased or pathetic human beings? Well, Aristotle applies exactly the same reasoning to human beings. He locates what he believes to be our unique or defining function. Quoting from Aristotle, he says, this will best be gained, I think, by asking what is the function of man? For the goodness and the excellence of a piper or a sculptor or the practicer of any art, and generally of those who have any function or business to do lies in that function. So man's good would seem to lie in his function if he has one. But can we suppose that while the carpenter and the cobbler has a function and a business of his own, man has no business, no function assigned to him by nature? Nay, surely as his several members, eye and hand and foot plainly have each their own function. So we must suppose that man also has some function over and above these. But then, uh, what is it? What is it, he asks. Life, evidently, this is Aristotle still, life, evidently, he has in common with even the plants. But we want that which is peculiar to him, man. We must exclude, therefore, the life of mere nutrition and growth. Plants do that. Next to this comes the life of sense. But this, too, he plainly shares with horses and cattle and all kinds of animals. Aristotle here is saying that we have many functions uh, as human beings. But what we must find is what is unique to humans and not merely those we share with other living creatures. So with those functions we share with plants and animals, yes, those are part of the human nature. Uh, a healthy, thriving, vital human being has those functions, 
but those aren't our defining functions. Similarly, we have certain functions that we share with the other animals, horses and cattle and like. Right? And those too are vital to being a healthy, functioning, thriving human being, but they're not unique to humans. And so again, they don't uh, segregate us from the rest of the animal community. So then he's saying it is not what he calls the vegetative functions, eat, grow, and reproduce. <coughs> These are the minimal functions of living nature. As such, um, these are not unique to human beings, but rather functions we share with all living reality. This is how he divides living reality, organic nature, from non-living reality, in organic nature. Again, notice according to function. But also he says it is not the basic animal functions, locomotion, we can move about, or sensitive capacities, I can feel. These divide the living world between the two kingdoms of plants, which lack those functions, and the animals, which not only eat and grow, but they also have the functions of locomotion and um, sentience. As such, these are not unique to humans, but rather functions we share with all living animal reality. There remains then the life whereby he acts, the life movement activity of his rational nature with its two sides or divisions, one rational as obeying reason and the other rational as having or exercising reason. I think I skipped over a slide here. Um, I did. I, slipped o I skipped over a slide. Sorry. It belongs here. But he does not consider um, our ability to experience emotions. He, uh, not explicitly, right? But I'm uh, chiming in here thinking that those the, our ability to experience emotions likewise are not unique to human beings. I think many of the higher animals now, not all higher animals, but I think many of the higher animals do indeed experience emotion, right? So my, my dog seems impossibly happy when I come home at the end of the day, or my cat seems continually annoyed when once again, I take her off my computer uh, keyboard and set her onto the ground, right? So I think that cats and dogs and other higher forms of animals do experience emotions and they have emotions. So our ability to experience emotions, to respond to emotions, et cetera, I don't think that's unique for human beings. So that's what's missing in this third bullet here. And I don't know where it went, but I'll try to restore it on some future version. All right, so if it's not our vegetative functions, if it's not our animal functions, and if it's not our abilities to experience emotions, what is it? Well, now you have his answer. He thinks it's our ability to reason to employ reason. The unique function of humans, according to Aristotle, is that we can reason. Thus, reason is at once our defining trait and our telos. Being a good human being, that is, being good as a human being, requires that we reason and that we reason well. But Aristotle is not merely talking about theoretical reason, or the exercise of reason in the pursuit of truth. Yes, that's part of what we do. But he's much more interested here in practical reason. That is the use of reason to govern and guide our actions, what we uh, choose to do. He means here by reason, the ability to deliberate over choices. So we can consider two courses of action in the abstract. And based on these deliberations, we can choose the the more reasonable, the preferable course of action based on that rational appraisal. Now he thinks this is something that human beings alone can do. Maybe he was wrong about that. Maybe dolphin do that too as well. But he thought that that was our unique segregating function. Here we see some of Aristotle's significance of his famous definition of man. Right? We could say his definition of human. He was a very much a, a sexist. I'm kind of glossing over that because I think it impedes our ability to see what is of value here. So, so if we were going to make this less sexist, sexist, we would say, what is his definition of humanity? But 
he defines humanity or the human as the rational animal. That's his definition. Now, it's only three words, but it's very dense. And every uh, one of those three words is really important. For instance, we begin with the, that's the definite article. He didn't suggest that human beings are a rational animal, among others. No, we're the rational animal. So again, he thinks this is what segregates us. This is what makes us a unique species unto ourselves. You know, we're social. Lots of other animals are social. We're political. Lots of other animals are political. Um, uh, we're familial. Lots of other animals are familial. So those are natural capacities for human beings, but they're not unique to human beings. Well, it is unique, he thinks, the rational animal, okay? Number two, rational. That is our telos, that's our segregating trait, the ability to use reason, both theoretical reason in the pursuit of abstract truth, but practical reason in the ability to choose rational courses of action based on rational deliberations and appraisals. And then number three, we are animals. And this is important too, because unlike his teacher Plato, he didn't suggest that we are an immaterial psyche or spirit who for a time has a, mo a meat suit. And then what we want to do is to kind of shuffle off this mortal coil, get rid of this meat suit, and then go and re rejoin the forms. That's what Plato had in mind. That's not Aristotle. Aristotle said, no, 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 you're not some immaterial spirit who for a moment is working through a body. You are an animal. That's what you are essentially. If you ever did run into some disembodied spirit, here's one thing I can tell you. That's not a human. Why? Because it's not an animal. Humans are essentially animals. Now, we're rational animals. We're not just any animal. We're the rational animal. But we are animals. Hence his definition, human as the rational animal. Now, Interestingly, St. Thomas Aquinas was very much an Aristotle fanboy, and he agrees with Aristotle on this. And he says, oh, Aristotle is correct. He's more correct than Plato. Aquinas does not agree with Plato. Aquinas does not think you're some immaterial soul who's trying to shed the body. Aquinas says, no, Aristotle's right. You're essentially an animal. Aquinas uh, is famous for having said, anima mea non est ego. If you speak Spanish, you can probably make that out yourself. If you don't, what is that saying? It's saying, my soul is not me. So Aquinas did think human beings had immortal souls, but he didn't identify the soul with the individual. The individual was an animal, an ensouled animal, but an animal nonetheless. Non-human animals, back to Aristotle now, non-human animals act on the basis of instinct or emotional responses. Thus, their choice is not motivated or guided by rational deliberation over abstract choices. We humans could, and sometimes do, live our lives that same way. In other words, we could live our lives where our choices are guided by instinct or emotional responses <coughs> and are not guided by rational deliberation. But if we're living life that way, we're living the life of an excellent pig, not the life of an excellent human being. Acting virtuously, in other words, acting as one is supposed to act as a human being for humans, is acting rationally. What Aristotle says, activity in accord with rational principle. So that is his functional account of good approach. What is it to say that that is a good human being? It's to say that that human being is making rational decisions, uh, choosing their, their life uh, uh, behaviors, et cetera, based on reason and in accord with reason and rational principle. Now, the second approach. The second approach involves this notion of eudaimonia and moral virtues or living the good life. Aristotle arrives at his conception of the good life for a human by asking uh, a rational being, uh, by asking what is it, uh, what is the natural good 
for man? This is his question. That is, what is it that all a human be, um, all humans desire for its own sake and not for the sake of anything else? So here it's helpful to distinguish between two kinds of values that philosophers distinguish between. One is intrinsic value, the other instrumental value. To say that something has intrinsic value is to say it's valuable in and of itself and not merely for some other reason. To say something has instrumental value is to say that it has value as a means to some other end. So the best example of something with instrumental value is money. As I record this lecture, it's a Thursday and I get paid tomorrow, yay. And do I value getting paid tomorrow? Yes. And do I value money? I certainly do. But why do I value money? I value money because it's a means to other things. It's a means to paying my bills. It's a means to uh, buying food. It's a means to entertainment. Uh, it's a means to um, uh, medicine, etc. It's a means to other things. That's why I value money. There is no value in having money in and of itself. It's only valuable as a means to something else. Imagine this. Imagine I said to you, I'm going to give you a million dollars. You go, oh, well, thank you very much. A million dollars. Yes. I said, okay, I'm going to give you a million dollars, but you can't use it for anything. What? So, well, you can't spend it. Hmm. Oh, and uh, you can't put it in the bank and earn interest. Oh, and you can't use it as collateral for a loan. Oh, well, what would be the point? Well, that's just it. There would be no point. There's no point to having a million dollars if you can't use it for something else. Having money is has no intrinsic value. It only has instrumental value. But notice something further. Let's say I value money because of some other value, let's say value A. And you say, why do you value A? Well, because of value B. Well, why do you value B? Well, because of C. Notice we're starting to see that pattern that we saw way back when we were looking at um, the cosmological argument, infinite regress. Where if I value A because of B and B because of C and C because of D, that has to stop someplace. Something has to be holding up this whole chain of valuing. Well, the only thing that can stop that infinite regress would be something of intrinsic value. Perhaps you already get the idea, but imagine this. I said, why are you taking this intro to philosophy class? He says, oh, well, because I want to finish the UCC. Why do you want to finish the UCC? Well, because I want to move along in my major and graduate. And why do you want to graduate? Well, because I want to get this degree. And why do you want this degree? Well, because I want to get a good job. And why do you, I could keep poking, why and why and why and why? But eventually, if I keep asking enough why questions, we're going to get to some place where you go, I value that because I just do. And maybe you say, well, because I want to enjoy my life. You say, well, and why do you want to enjoy your life? I just do. Notice the why question doesn't even make sense there because it's not like enjoying your life has instrumental value. No, enjoying your life presumably has intrinsic value. It's valuable just because it is what it is, just because it has the character it has. All right, so this is the question Aristotle is asking. If there's anything in our life which has instrumental value, what is it in our lives that has intrinsic value? What is it that stands at the end of that uh, system or that series of valuing? If then, quoting from Aristotle, if then in what we do, there be some end which we wish for on its own account, choosing all others as a means to this, this evidently will be the good or the best of all things. So the system of instrumental goods cannot go on indefinitely because, as Aristotle says, not every end without exception as a means to something else could be. For we should go on ad infinitum, and desire would be left void and objectless. 
In other words, if there's anything we value instrumentally, there must be something we value intrinsically. Aristotle points out that not everything can be valued or have value for some other reason, for that would lead to an infinite regress. Thus, we must value, uh, uh, we, if we value anything at all, there must be something we value intrinsically. And this thing or things of intrinsic value is what motivates all of our actions. This is a teleological view of human action. In other words, it presumes that human actions are goal driven. I act in order to achieve an end or a goal. The idea is that thoughtful, deliberate action is goal oriented. But this system of goals cannot be an infinite series, infinite regress. There must be a summa bonum or a final end to all of human actions. Three types of lies. I think I want to skip through this. Yeah, I'm going to skip through this. It's in the notes. I'm not saying, I'm not forbidding you to read it. I'm just going to skip it. So now I want to ask, well, what is the final good, according to Aristotle? The summa bonum, to use St. Thomas Aquinas' word for it. Of course, Aquinas wrote in Latin, Aristotle wrote in Greek. In a word for Aristotle, it is eudaimonia. I always used to pronounce that eudaimonia. And then I have a, a, had a colleague, he passed away a number of years ago, but I had a colleague and he said, no, it's pronounced eudaimonia. And he actually spoke and read ancient Greek. So I defer to his opinion on this, eudaimonia. But notice uh, it's a compound word in Greek. EU is that Greek prefix, which means happy or blessed or fortunate or lucky. And diomon is that word in Greek, which means activity, uh, action. So eudaimonia or eudaimonia is good action or happy activity. So it's understood that, that um, I, I think this is most often translated as happiness, right? And this is how it's been translated into English, happiness. But Aristotle's notion of happiness is not our notion of feeling happy. It's his notion of good activity, living well, thriving. So when you hear eudaimonia, even though it's translated as happiness, I think it's better to understand it as human thriving. Right? So quoting from Aristotle, again, translated as happiness, happiness, thriving, seems to more than anything else to answer this description, the end towards which all human beings seek for its own sake. For we always choose it for itself and never for the sake of something else, while honor and pleasure and reason and all virtue and excellence we choose partly indeed for themselves, for apart uh, from them any result we should choose each of them, but partly also for the sake of happiness, supposing that they will help make us happy. So what he's saying is the final good, the end towards which all human beings uh, tend, what they seek, <clears throat> what motivates their behavior is an attempt to secure happiness, thriving, well-being, to live well as a human being. Eudaimonia, Aristotle's term for happiness in the sense of a state of thriving, health, actualized wellness, or full human development. Aristotle's special notion of happiness is not our conception of feeling happy or euphoria. These feelings are only unsustainable sensations. Notice they're the kind of sensations we might acquire through pharmaceuticals. Right? Rather, Aristotle is thinking of a stable state, like being healthy. Aristotle's term eudaimonia means something closer to living well or thriving. And it includes all the natural human capacities, social, political, economic, creative, familial and virtuous acts as well as good feelings. So again, think back to the first part of this where I'm talking about realizing human nature. Well, we are naturally political animals. 
So fulfilling our human nature, being fulfilled as a human being, being happy, thriving as a human being means being political and social and economic and creative and familial and the rest. No matter how good one feels about oneself or life, etc., one would not be happy in Aristotle's sense unless one were living a life fit for a human being, actively fulfilling your human potential, being fully human. But this generalization, uh, quoting from Aristotle, but this generalization on our argument is brought to the same point as before. This point we must try to explain more clearly. We see that there are many ends, but some of these ends are chosen only as means, such as wealth. So it is plain that not all ends are final. But the best of all things must, we can see, be something final. Now that which is pursued as an end in itself is more final than that which is pursued as a means to something else. That is strictly final, is uh, always chosen as an end, and is itself never chosen as a means. Back to me now. Further happiness, as with all judgments of virtuous functioning generally, is not a matter of black and white. Few people are perfectly happy, excellent, and few people are perfectly unhappy, having no human excellences of any kind or to any degree. Close observation of our species will reveal that some of us are thriving more than others. So just as we can observe apple trees and distinguish the thriving, vigorous apple trees from the withering, pathetic apple trees, we can do so with our own species as well. Aristotle encourages us to do just that. Further, Aristotle says, there are certain kinds of characteristic behaviors, character traits, that are necessary for or contribute to being happy, thriving, or at least as happy as one can be given life's ups and downs. These habitual character traits taken in some are what Aristotle refers to as the virtuous character. He recommends that we attempt to develop the virtuous character in ourselves and in others as much as possible. Again, quoting from Aristotle, but no one chooses happiness for the sake of these things uh, or as a means to anything else at all. We seem to be led to the same conclusion when we start from the notion of self-sufficiency. The final good is thought to be self-sufficiency or all-sufficing. But Aristotle points out that given our nature, our happiness thriving is ultimately tied to our success in social relations. Why? Because we're social beings. So achieving happiness is not something I can do unilaterally. Achieving happiness is something that I require a society for, and I must interact uh, efficiently within that society in order to achieve my happiness. Why? Because I'm a social creature, right? Uh, I'm not a badger. <laughs> I'm a human being. In applying this term, we do not regard a man as an individual leading a solitary life, but we also take account of parents, children, wife, and in short, friends and fellow citizens generally, since man is naturally a social being. Some limit must indeed be set on this, for if you go on to parents, to descendants and friends and friends, you will never come to a stop. So there's a limit to just how socially involved we need to be maybe how many friends on Facebook you should have. I'm gonna skip ahead a bit. I'm gonna skip ahead a bit. It's all in the notes, so. Uh, three qualities of the final good or the ultimate good, intrinsically valuable, we certainly covered that, proper to our nature, in other words, the realization of human nature, not badger na nature and realizable in that it can largely be acquired independent of being given to us from the outside. This is one of the reasons why he thinks honor is not a thing of intrinsic value. He thinks it has value, but it's not of intrinsic value, and in part because honor often relies more on people bestowing honors upon you 
rather than you achieving it on your own. Moral virtue, okay. So a moral virtue for Aristotle is a good habit. It's a habit that helps you achieve or contributes to successful living. So this is what he means by a moral virtue. It's a habit, it's a good habit, and what makes it a good habit, it helps you achieve success. So you probably had to take a, a course in freshman experience, and maybe in freshman experience, they talked about how to outline paragraphs or how to research in the library or how to study, et cetera. Well, what they were giving you is theoretical knowledge on how you would achieve those, those uh, behaviors. If you read a paragraph on how to highlight, does that make you a better student? No, frankly. What re is required is to take that theoretical information and turn it into a habit to make it a good study habit. Now, what makes it a good study habit? It's a habit that helps you achieve success, right? It helps you actually do what it is you want to do as a human being, to be a good student in that regard, right? Um, a good habit in playing the piano, right? So you learn certain finger arrangements or whatnot. What, why, what makes those good habits? They help you achieve success as a pianist. Uh, good habits in golf or basketball or ballet are habits that help you achieve success as a golfer or a basketball player or a ballet dancer. Now, a bad habit, it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, that's an evil, wicked Satan's habit. Well, there might be golfers that tell you that, but it doesn't mean it's an evil, wicked Satan's habit. It just means it is not helpful in achieving success. Worse, it prevents you from being successful. A bad study habit, a bad golf habit, a bad ballet habit, like sickling your foot or falling out of your turns, right? These habits are bad because they prevent you from being successful. Now, we're talking about habits in sports or in dance or in music or in um, uh, studying, but Aristotle is talking even more broadly than that. What are the habits that help you achieve success as a human being? And what are the vices that prevent you from achieving success as a human being? Again, a good habit is a habit that helps you achieve success. A bad habit or a vice is simply a habit that prevents you from being successful. This is what Aristotle has in mind by the notion of a moral virtue. Now, what are these good habits? Again, he thinks that if we canvas successful, thriving human beings, we will see that they have certain habits in common, certain characteristic behaviors in common. Um, but he also thinks that these good habits have themselves a nature, that they always are um, uh, reside between vicious extremes. So this is called the doctrine of the golden mean. And the doctrine of the golden mean is the idea that the virtuous habit always resides between two vicious extremes. There is an ancient Greek myth about some narrow uh, um, a strait of water. And on either side of that strait, that narrow strait, there were two monsters. And on one side was Scylla, and the other side was Caribus. And if you got too close to either, you'd be devoured, right? Because either Scylla would get you or Caribus would get you. And so the trick was, the goal was, the requirement was to navigate that narrow passage, which was midway between the Scylla and the Caribus. Well, Aristotle has a similar notion here. The virtue is always going to be midway between vicious extremes, vicious extremes of too much or too little. So he speaks about a number of virtues. I'm only going to talk about four. And the four virtues I want to talk about are these, courage. Courage, he thinks, is midway between the vice of cowardice, having too much fear, and the vice of rashness not having enough fear, right? So, you know, bumper stickers notwithstanding, no fear is a really bad idea. That's not a virtue, that's a vice. But too much fear is a vice as well. Too much fear and you're gonna miss out on opportunities. You won't ask your significant other to marry you or you won't take that, that job promotion or you won't ask for that raise. 
if you're too fearful. On the other hand, if you don't have enough fear, you're going to make silly, stupid, rash decisions, and you're not going to live a happy and successful life, at least not as happy or as successful as it might otherwise be. Virtuous people have courage, and courage stands midway between too much and too little. Temperance is basically knowing when to say when, and it's midway between lasciviousness too much concern with pleasure, pursuing pleasure to the extreme, to your own detriment, to, uh, to, uh, to you know, which, which uh, endangers your health and well-being, or asceticism, not having any pleasure at all, like those medieval monks who used to wear very uncomfortable clothing and sleep in uncomfortable beds and beat themselves from time to time. And Aristotle would say, well, that's not a virtue. That's asceticism. That's a vice. That's that's too little concern with pleasure. So the virtue is midway between too much and too little. Pride, oh, this got him into trouble with later generations of Christians because Christians had always said that pride was a, a vice, but he's saying pride is a virtue. But now, of course, what does he mean by that? Well, the virtue of pride is midway between too much hubris, thinking yourself godlike. That's not a virtue. That's a vice. That'll bring you down in the end. That's the kind of pride that goeth before the fall. Right? But then there's too little pride. In other words, too little self-respect. You're a doormat. You let everybody walk all over you because you have no sense of self-worth. That's not a virtue. That's a vice. So midway between the vice of too much and the vice of too little, we find the virtue of pride. Today, we might more call this self-respect or a sense of self-worth. I may not use the word pride. <laughs> and then the fourth one, I like to point out the fourth one, friendliness, because again, it underscores the idea that Aristotle's notion is that human beings are social animals. So our success, our thriving, our eudaimonia requires navigating the social landscape. And that requires friendliness. Now, friendliness is basically a concern with getting on with other people. So you want to try to get on with, uh, with other people. Too little friendliness, and you're obnoxious, you are belligerent, you've always got a chip on your shoulder, nobody wants to be your lab partner, nobody wants to sit next to you on the bus, nobody wants to be your next door neighbor because you're always problematic, you're always looking for an argument, etc. The other side of that, the other vice, would be too much concern for the opinion of others, right? To be obsequious, uh, to be so concerned that everybody like you. Um, you know, so if degenerates don't like you, is that a problem? Or is that actually maybe a good thing, right? So the, the virtue of friendliness is midway between too much concern for the opinion of others and wanting to get along with others and too little concern for getting along with others and wanting to get along with others. Again, the mid middle uh, path there is the virtue between vicious extremes. And that's overall his doctrine of uh, the golden mean. Now, how are we to acquire these virtues? Well, basically the same way you get to Carnegie Hall, practice, practice, practice. Right? Well, what does he mean by that? He means in order to become a courageous person, I have to do courageous things. So think about that for a moment, right? That might be different about how, than how you were thinking about it earlier or how other people might think about it. First, I become a courageous person. Then I go out and I do courageous things. No, says Aristotle, quite the reverse. First, you go out and do courageous things. And in so doing, you make yourself into a courageous person. Again, it's not like first I become a great basketball player, then I go out and I play some good games. It's the other way around. I become a great basketball player by playing well. I become courageous by doing courageous things. I become temperate by doing temperate things. Over and over and over again, practice, right? So I become that which I seek to become by doing those things and correcting, correcting for mistakes. So sometimes I err on the side of too much. Oh my gosh, 
I was I was too rash. I made a bad choice. I shouldn't have done that. Dial that back a bit. Or sometimes I don't take enough of a chance. I'm too cautious. Oh, that was a mistake. So by looking at my performance, by evaluating my performance, by by doing enlightened trial and error, eventually I start hitting that virtuous middle, let's say uh, over and over and over again. And once that happens, it starts to become a habit. Right? It starts to become a habit so much so that I don't even have to think about it anymore. Aristotle actually coins the phrase second nature. So no one is courageous by nature and no one is courageous against nature. One becomes courageous, one develops courage as a second nature through habitual uh, repetition of courageous acts, right? According to Aristotle, being an excellent human being is just like being an excellent golfer. One becomes that by practice. And keep in mind that practice, if it's to be useful, is a rational affair involving constant performance assessment and reassessment. Education should be structured so that it develops a bodily and mentally faculties and encourages this kind of enlightened trial and error where it, uh, it, it um, reinforces good choices and it negatively reinforces poor choices and encourages the individual to rethink and not, uh, not um, repeat that kind of choice. Quoting from Aristotle, excellence then being of these two kinds, intellectual and moral, intellectual excellence owes its birth and growth mainly to instruction and so requires time and experience while moral excellence is the result of habit or custom and has accordingly in our language received a name formed by a slight change from the word for habit or custom. Ethos is, comes from the Greek word for habit or custom, ethics. Again, where we do things by nature, we get the power first. This is quoting from Aristotle. Excuse me. And we put the power forth in act afterwards, as we plainly see in cases of the senses. For it is not by constantly seeing and hearing that we acquire those faculties, but on the contrary, we had the power first and then used them instead of acquiring the power by use but the virtues we acquire by doing the acts, as is the case in the arts too. We learn an art by doing that which we wish to do when we have learned it. We become builders by building and harpers by harping, playing the harp. And so by doing just acts, we become just, and by doing acts of temperance and courage, we become temperate and courage, a courageous. Again, both the moral virtue and the corresponding vices result from and are formed by the same acts, and this is the case in the arts also. It is by harping that good harpers and bad harpers alike are produced, and so with builders and the rest. By building well, they become good builders, and bad builders by building badly. Indeed, if it were not so, they would not want anyone to teach them, but would all be born, either good or bad, at their trades. And it is just the same with the virtues also. It is by our conduct in our intercourse with other men that we become just or unjust, and by acting in circumstances of danger and training ourselves either to feel confidence that we become courageous or cowardly. So too, with our animal appetites and the passion of anger, for by behaving in this way or that, on the occasion with which these passions are concerned, some become temperate and gentle, others profligate and ill-tempered. In a word, acts of any kind produce habits or characters of the same kind. Hence, we ought to make sure that our act be of a certain kind, for the resulting character varies as they vary. So there's an old saying 
be careful of your thoughts, they become your acts. Be careful of your acts, they become your habits. Be careful of your habits, that becomes your character. Be careful of your character, that becomes your destiny. Well, that's very Aristotelian, right? The repetitive uh, acts we engage in over and over again become habits, which ultimately form our character and our character forms our destiny. That is how we will fare in this world and whether we will achieve eudaimonia or not. From this, it is plain that none of the moral excellence or virtues are implanted in us by nature, for that which is by nature cannot be altered by training. The virtues then neither come from nature nor against nature, but nature gives the capacity for acquiring them. And this is developed by training. Again, Aristotle coins the term second nature. Again, playing golf uh, well is second nature to Tiger Woods, but not his part of his nature. Going on, he says, therefore citizens must be trained to be virtuous as one would train an athlete or a musician. It makes no small difference, therefore, whether a man be trained from his youth up in this way or that, but a great difference, or rather all the difference. And Aristotle believes that it falls to the state to engage in this training. He claims, this is Aristotle's advice, children during, uh, should during their earliest years be carefully protected from all injurious associations and be introduced to such amusements as will prepare them for serious duties of life. So even at the very young ages, we might say pre-K, kindergarten, etc., they should be uh, introduced to amusements, but the amusements that will prepare them for the more serious duties of life, socialization, cooperation, etc. Going on, Aristotle says, <clears throat> their literary education should begin in their seventh year and continue to their 21st year. So he thought that your education could carry you through college, right? Maybe he was a Bernie Sanders uh, supporter, I don't know. This period is divided into two courses of training, one from age seven to puberty and the other from puberty to age 21. So notice it even seems to be like a, a grammar school to middle and high school division right, that we still adhere to. Such education should not be left to the private enterprise, but should be undertaken by the state. And why is that? Because we're talking about training the citizenry to be excellent human beings. And we need an excellent citizenry to have an excellent state, but notice we also need an excellent state to create and sustain an excellent citizenry. I'm going to skip that, it's in the notes. Four levels of moral development. The virtuous person has the good habits, doesn't need to think about it, it's second nature. Continent person doesn't quite have the habits, can put in a good performance, but has to be careful, has to be deliberate. It still takes an act of will. Incontinent person, the person who knows what they should be doing, but lacks the self-control and, uh, and the willpower to do what they know to be the right thing to do. And the wretched person not only lacks the willpower and the self-control, they lack the theoretical knowledge. They don't even understand that they're they are their biggest problem. They are why they are miserable. No, it's not that your boss is an asshole. No, it's not that your wife just doesn't understand you. It's you are an alcoholic. That's a wretched person. Morality as virtue summary. I summarized this enough already. Romantic critique. So now we're critiquing Aristotle a bit. One might accept the functional account of good, X is good, means X does what X's are supposed to do and does it well, but reject Aristotle's notion of what the human telos is or the purpose towards which he thinks all humanity is directed. For instance, if one thinks of romanticism, the romantic heroes we find uh, pursue values that are very different from the Aristotelian virtuous human persons. The romantic hero typically is not motivated by reason, but rather is motivated by passion. 
the point of life is not activity within the bounds of rational principle, as Aristotle would say, but rather experiential. To love the greatest love, or to feel the greatest patriotism, or to burn with the greatest desire. This is the purpose of human life. One thinks of um, Thoreau, who says, that I wanted to live deep and suck out the very marrow of life. Frankly, I always thought that was a little disgusting, but that's another story. But nevertheless, it's an encouragement to live life to the fullest in the sense of the experiential and the passionate. And that's the nature of the romantic hero. But notice on this notion of heroism, this notion of virtue, you get a different pantheon of heroes and a different set of virtues. Now, if this is the purpose of life, if this is the good that we should pursue, then we have different virtues to develop. Far different from the cardinal virtues of Aristotle and different persons will populate our pantheon of heroes. So one might say that the good human being is the one who does what human beings are supposed to do and does it well, and yet come up with a completely different notion or ethical system. So that's one critique of Aristotle. Similarly, one I can see Aquinas as adopting Aristotle's functional account of good, but rejecting Aristotle's notion of what our true telos or end is. Aquinas agrees with much of what Aristotle has to say, but he believes that Aristotle was simply aiming too low when he says that the desire of humans, our ultimate goal, our, our, uh, our ultimate end is human happiness or eudaimonia. Again, Aquinas is critical of Aristotle on this point. What we really seek, according to Aquinas, is not finite happiness. Oh, I'd like to be happy for the next five years and then it doesn't matter. Or, oh, I'd like to be happy for the next 10 years and then I don't care. No, that's not what we really seek. What we really seek is infinite, indefinite happiness, Aquinas maintains. Close attention reveals that what we truly want is unending, unlimited, ongoing happiness and fulfillment. So Aristotle's worldly eudaimonia is not the true end that we seek, nor can his worldly or cardinal virtues tell us how to achieve the genuine end that we desire, that is, our true summa bonum. Further, Aquinas thought that we could prove the existence of an all-powerful, all-loving God philosophically. So belief in such a being need not merely rely on faith, but on certain philosophical proof. For uh, one does not come to believe this merely as a matter of, oh, for those who don't come to believe this as a matter of philosophy, there is also revelation. Thus, both philosophy and faith direct us to seek and even to expect the happiness commensurate with God's power and love. So what kind of power, uh, what kind of happiness could an all good, all powerful God bestow on me? Exactly the kind of happiness I'm looking for, unending, eternal, infinite happiness, just what we wanted. I'd like to point out uh, something called the Baltimore Catechism. I talk more about it in the notes, but here I'm just going to say it's a, a book that was used to catechize young up and coming Catholics in the Catholic religion. But I particularly am struck by the sixth question of the Baltimore Catechism, which was this, why did God make me, right? Now, the catechism is directed at uh, grade school children, usually six, seven, or eight, or whatnot, right? Grammar school. And look at that question, why did God make me? Well, that's something that maybe a seven-year-old could get their head around. Why did God make me? But poke at it just a bit, and you see that that's an Aristotelian question. And of course, it's a Thomistic question. For what purpose did God make me? For what purpose am I designed? To what end am I directed? What is my goal? What is my function? What is my telos? That's what that question is asking me. And here's the answer, according to the Baltimore Catechism. God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in heaven. Now, 
notice that answer. What it's claiming is the true fulfillment of our human nature is only had in the knowledge and the love and the service of God. That's how we achieve our true human happiness, our true of summa bonum. But notice it's keeping this notion of, and what is that? That is what provides us with genuine happiness and not this bargain basement happiness that Aristotle was content with, eudaimonia, but the unending eternal happiness that we have and we gain through the knowledge, the love and the service of God. So my point here is just that um, this, this teaching of the Catholic church is very much influenced by the Aristotelian notion of virtue and happiness and Aquinas really capitalizes on that. Then finally, the existentialist critique would be a critique which says, look, there is no such thing as a fixed human nature. Well, if there's no such thing as a fixed human nature, then there's no way we could say what it is that all and only human beings are supposed to do. It's much more left up to us. Your choice or anyone else's about what it means to be human has absolutely no claim on me. Rather, I must choose for myself what it means to be this humanity. While we think in terms of common nouns, human, cat, apple tree, we must live our lives as individuals. This is what the existentialists tell us. It's somewhat paradoxical in exactly the same way Plato had suggested. We think in common nouns, but we experience the world as individual moments, individual encountering other individuals. So what we think, common nouns like cat or cat form, we cannot see since we only see individuals. And what we see, individual and particular cats, we cannot think the generic concept of or abstract concept of cat form. But where is uh, Plato, in Plato thought, uh, the forms have greater degree of realities. Existentialists assure us that the reality is, uh, that the really real is the individual confronting the world individually and on individual terms. So the existentialists wanna say that the abstracts of Plato are not as real as the individuals of uh, living their individual lives. So what matters is not what human nature is, but what I choose to be for myself. Consequently, since there is no fixed human nature, one cannot apply the functional account of good to evaluate human beings generally. Now, this is not to suggest that the existentialist claims there are no criteria by which to assess our lives. The criterion is to honestly look at our lives and embrace what we see. One must take a sober and unvarnished look at one's life and, make, and making no excuses, ask oneself, am I living up to my own values? While this is indeed subjective and a subjective test, to ask and answer this question honestly and authentically can be very convicting. All right, so that brings us to the end of our foray into Aristotle's ethics. I hope you found this uh, useful and, and, and I hope also you saw how it dovetails in with his metaphysics and his epistemology, which we studied earlier in the term. Naturally, if this is anything you want to discuss with me further, share questions, et cetera, um, I'm available to you. So thank you for your attention and until next time.